May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Look up. Look up. Yep, I mean it literally. Take a moment to look up at the ceiling above you. And may I state the obvious, that it's curved and it's pointed, and it's got wooden struts or supports running across it. Might I ask you to turn the ceiling upside down for a moment in your minds and see it as the hull of a boat? Then picture yourself sitting in one of those wooden beams as if it were a bench. You're now sitting at the bottom of the boat and there's a stench in the air. You're not alone because you are bound with strips of cloth to two sisters and a brother and they've come to sit with you. Enter Mary, Martha and Lazarus. In today's Gospel, we encounter Mary in the middle of events, but we need to know the backstory. Mary is the one who anointed Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Now her brother Lazarus is gravely ill. And so prior to this Gospel passage, she and her sister Martha have sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. And Jesus, having heard it, replies, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And as we are told earlier in the chapter, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So instead of going directly to Lazarus, Jesus goes off to Judea with his disciples. And having met Mary in the middle of this story, she's rightly pretty cross with Jesus for this. Lazarus has been dying and is now believed to be dead. Mary and Martha have pleaded with him, yet Jesus has not dropped everything to go and to heal Lazarus. And so we hear Mary's lament, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And how many times might we have questioned where God was in the midst of pain, in suffering and death? And Jesus' reaction is one of the fully human Christ rather than the fully divine. He sees her weeping and the Jews also who came with her weeping. And he's greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. In fact, we're told that Jesus wept like any other human would do, full of love for Lazarus, Martha and Mary, but perhaps even grief, remorse, dare I say even guilt for the suffering that he has put them through. And the crowd are suffering. And there the crowd asking the question we might also ask. Could he, could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I would definitely be asking that. Why didn't you even try to come? And it is Martha, Lazarus's other sister, who points out the ugly reality to Jesus. There is a stench because he's been dead four days. And Christ suggests, however, that it is a matter of faith. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Frankly, at this point, I might have told him where to go. But then Jesus cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And we are told the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What a transformation. All of these worlds turned upside down by God in a moment. 
And who is it that we might identify with in this gospel? Is it Mary, practical and pleading, rightly crying out for the lack of action? Is it Martha, pointing out the ugly reality of death and suffering? Is it the human part of Jesus who weeps out of love, out of despair at the plight of Lazarus, or the grief of Mary and Martha? Or is it Lazarus who's revived, reanimated, resurrect, resurrected, the one seemingly brought back from the dead? Lazarus, the man who is no longer bound. Or is it the divine Jesus so deeply at one with God, never separated, that raises Lazarus from his unconsciousness or death. The gospel narrative is like a mini foretelling of Christ's passion and resurrection itself, full of pain and suffering before it becomes joyful. It tests the very limits of our faith. And we see all the stories, characters in our lives, and we will encounter parts of all of them in ourselves. We do not need to search too deeply. We will recognize them. There are the suffering parts of them as there are of us, those that have suffered cruelty or injustice, or those parts of us that are inhabited by stench and constraints, by bindings, by ties. And we will find all parts of these characters in the many people who have gone before us, our ancestors, those who have gone before us whose lives were directed to God. We call them saints. And we do not need to fetishize the saints. We do no service to us or to them by separating them from ourselves, by saying they are uniquely or specially holy. Humans become saints, not out of some special and effortful moral transformation. No, they are no different to us, people with strengths and weaknesses, the same characteristics that we possess. What we find in ourselves that manifests itself as anger or rage, when harnessed towards God, becomes the seeking out of justice. Anxiety and fear can be transformed by God into sensitivity and kindness. The desire for status and pride can become the identification with the poor and downtrodden. I could go on. And if saints are people like us, how does that happen? Well, they are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and with their energy focused on God. Or perhaps more simply, they became what they loved. Saints are transformed only because they have redirected their lives, their minds, their hearts, their actions towards God before everything else. And there are plenty of people alive today who do the same. They love God, so begin to embody him. They become the thing they love. Just as God loved the world so that he becomes human in Christ. And so you see, those who have gone before us, whether ancestors or ghosts, that may have or still do haunt us, can become saints that sit with us, that accompany us, that untie our binds, remove our stench, and release us just as Jesus does to Lazarus. There remain as many saints walking amongst us today as there have ever been. Martha, Mary, Lazarus are just the beginning of the examples that are set before us. And when we can walk no further in our own power, when we are bound, stinking, and given up for dead like Lazarus, we return to God to revive and transform us. So look up, look up at the ceiling. It has become a boat. We're sat on a bench with two sisters and a brother who are tied to us. 
Suddenly, the boat fills up. Many more people come to sit with us. They release us from the ropes, the chains, the bonds, and the stench. We're now tied to them by bonds of love. We are not alone, but are sitting next to all the saints. God's love has turned the world, our lives, and the lives of all the saints upside down. Amen.